Uh, my own work, as you heard, focuses on the social and political consequences of the net and the many platforms that it supports. Lately, I've become interested in structures of feeling, soft structures of feeling, or affect and civic engagement. And so this is what I would like to talk about today through going over some work that we've been completing on structures of storytelling and Twitter. Uh, with my colleagues at UIC, we've been tracking sentiment expression online and following tags including Egypt and the events surrounding the uh, resignation of Hosni Mubarak in early 2011. We've also been tracking several tags associated with the Occupy movement and also tracking uh, many uh, um, uh, tags featured under trending topics. Um, this has led to a lot of research productivity for us um, and several projects. Some of these are listed here, including a book for me. Um, there's not enough um, time to cover all of that uh, today. And thank you, by the way, for showing up for our panel and not being seduced by Lancaster nightlife. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to um, try to not make this very long, and I'm going to focus on the one study on Egypt that um, started it all and marked a, a turn to affect for me and an affective turn personally, and then wrap things up with some remarks on what I mean by the term affective publics. Um, so we're not, uh, we didn't start out looking for affect. Um, we're we study journalism, and most of us have a background in social psychology. So we kind of sort of stumbled on affect as the most convincing explanation for some of the things that we were observing. We were primarily, you know, starting out, we were interested uh, in Twitter as a platform for news storytelling, enabling collaborative um, co-writing, co-creation of news stories, but in most cases facilitating um, collaborative filtering and curation of news content. And so collectively produced uh, news feeds by citizens committing independent or coordinated acts of journalism presents an important alternative to the dominant news economy, especially as many mainstream media have to shut down or restrict their international bureaus due to financial constraints. And also in situations where uh, uh, access to media is restricted, controlled, or not trusted, Twitter quickly emerges as an alternative or a primary channel for information sharing and news dissemination. This sort of sums up um, the premise for a lot of our work. Um, I'm not going to cover all of it. I will focus on some of the points that specifically relate to this um, conference the most. So obviously we looked at research that examines Twitter as a news reporting mechanism. Uh, what I want to focus on is uh, work that researchers have been doing on how Twitter is used in news-breaking situations in anticipation or in premediation of events that are happening or are about to happen, thus further contributing and cultivating a culture of instantaneity in news reporting. So um, let me pause here for a moment and um, talk about the term premediation because it's so central to how we operationalize our research and also how we interpret our findings. We um, borrow the term from Richard Grusin who developed it to describe the form that events take on before they turn into stories. Um, so this aspect, this distinction was very interesting to us. Uh, Grusin makes the point that premediation is very rich in affect and uh, it's dominated news storytelling post 9-11, especially in the US. And he points to the news scroller that's become a permanent fixture of news storytelling, especially post 9-11, as an example of premediation in news and also as an aspect of news that further accentuates this obsession with its instantaneity. Uh, the platform functions as an ambient, always on news environment, and Al Fermita has done some excellent work on this. It introduces hybridity in news values and news production, and Andy Chadwick and Adrian Russell have both done some really good work on this. In terms of work that's focused on Twitter as a news sharing mechanism during uprisings, um, what I'd like to highlight is um, that most researchers who examine that tend to take a traditional gatekeeping approach. So they focus on who says what to whom, with what effect. They're very quick to point out at the same time that what is important is not just who is broadcasting, but also who's able to listen in on what's going on as the platform of, affords visibility and voice to underrepresented and marginalized issues and publics. 
Um, in fact, um, Kate Lacey has an excellent book out. It's called Listening Publics and unpacks this whole idea of listening and the sort of publics that it calls into being. Uh, and then I would like also to shift the emphasis back on who is broadcasting, because in most of these cases, we're looking at about at a certain 10% who is telling the story um, on their own terms, thus shaping the form of the story, framing the story. So with all of this in mind, uh, we set out to examine the form that news took on uh, about Egypt as it was broadcast to the rest of the world via Twitter. Uh, we were very interested in the news values that characterize the stream, and we adopted John Hartley's definition of news values be as the things that turn events into stories. So Hartley um, understands news values as being evolving, ever evolving, and being about the stories told and not necessarily about the news or the events themselves. And again, given our interest in uh, pre-mediation, our interest in mediality, this is, was um, especially pertinent to our conceptualization. And we use this typology that's presented here uh, because it's the most comprehensive and also most inclusive of a variety of different mentalities towards storytelling. And then we were also interested in the form, you know, the look, the shape, the feel of news as specific to sociocultural context. And here we took a cue from Bernhurst, uh, Bernhurst and Neron's work on the, the form of news. Um, for this one, our research questions were very specific and general. We wanted to know what news values were present in that particular stream. And we also wanted to get a sense for the form that storytelling took on as it was broadcast um, during the time of the uprisings. Our method, we utilized the mixed methods approach. This was an adventure into big and deep data analysis. <laughs> we did most of this in 2011 when a lot of the tools that we use now weren't really capable to analyze this sort of um, uh, volumes of data. I mean, um, to give you an idea, at the time, a uh, 1.5 million multilingual data set was considered rather massive and crashed every computer that I tried to load it on. Uh, but these days, you know, I sit on panels with colleagues from um, the SOMI lab at U of Washington or the University of Amsterdam, and they can just, you know, they have tools and scripts that analyze 30 million data sets, uh, tweet data, uh, data sets, just like that. Um, so a lot of the challenges that we had involved um, getting some of the tools to analyze what we wanted um, what we wanted them to analyze, the volume of the data set. Uh, but we ended up using R to do a frequency analysis of uh, the totality of activity ranging, covering the period between January 24th and February 25th, uh, which resulted in 1.5 million multilingual tweets. We did um, a number of different computerized content analysis looking at uh, semantic patterns, relationship between undressivity markers, the flow of information, and then we pulled a subsample of 300,000 tweets and ran a discourse analysis on that to support um, our quantitative findings and also to get a sense for the, for the form of news. And here's what we found. Um, a lot of the old news values that you're accustomed to seeing give form, give shape to the news were there. So things like large scale of news, consonants, personification, drama, action, all that stuff was there. I don't want to spend too much time talking about that. I'm more interested in some of the remediations, reshapings of old values or newer news values that we observed. And because that's what led us to the, our findings on effective news and effective publics. And the first one I want to talk about is this idea of um, instantaneity. So we use the term instantaneity to refer to the drama of events, or rather, yeah, the drama of events unfolding, being recorded, and being reported live through a process that instantly turns events into stories. I'm not suggesting that this is specific to Twitter, but I am suggesting that it is something that's amplified via the platform of Twitter. And so this was evident in uh, words that appeared and reappeared throughout the stream, live, urgent, happening now, but also in the rhythm and the pace of the stream, 
and I'll show you a couple of graphs that exemplify that. So this is one of our first uh, graphs that we were able to put together using R. If there was ever a museum of Twitter research, this would be right front and center. I have some more sophisticated gra graphs later on. Uh, but let me explain what's going on here. So this graph depicts um, tweets that were broadcast in intervals of five minutes. Uh, again, you can see we're starting on the 24th of January. What's going on here is just a little bit of activity on the ground. These are people within Egypt organizing, trying to figure out where they want to meet to protest. At some point, they figure out that the police are eavesdropping on their stream. So they make plans offline to meet elsewhere. Then they advertise they're going to meet elsewhere online. The cops are fooled. They figure that out. They come back on the stream. They rejoice. So it's all of this, in fact. And uh, when I read it for the discourse analysis, I didn't pull out those excerpts. I just read them in the flow of the stream. It's really fascinating to read it. It reads like a novel, except it's real. Um, and then there's the flat line, and that's when the internet was shut down. And when it's turned back on, this is a different event. The whole world is watching in anticipation, in permediation of the announcement of Mubarak's resignation, which comes here, and there's a peak, which is at a little over 10,000 tweets every five minutes. And that was phenomenal at the time. It was record-breaking. Um, now it's a record that's been topped many times again, including the time that um, Ellen DeGeneres took that famous selfie at the Oscars. And then here's a <laughs> close-up of that activity. And then um, a chart that depicts um, our findings, like the total volume of tweets. So the blue lines uh, reflect that. And you can see that the peak is reached at the time of the announcement at a little over 160,000 tweets. Uh, the green lines depict the total volume of retweets, which was very high for this, uh, for this particular stream, meaning that indicating that the level, the spreadability of um, data was very high, thus lending support to our conclusions about instantaneity. Also, the red lines depict the total volume of at replies, also fairly high for what we're accustomed to seeing. Again, showing that people were very vested in telling their story and getting their story out quickly. <clears throat> Um, the second thing I want to talk about is this idea of um, crowdsourced elites. So there were two groups that dominated the stream. One was mainstream media. They had a fairly static presence on the stream, mostly through um, news updates that they just dumped into the stream. A second, more vocal um, group emerged, and they consisted of activists on the ground who were live tweeting the events and people from abroad who were collecting, uh, filtering, and curating information. And these people, the second group, was retweeted or crowdsourced, as we say, to prominence through the long tail of the Twitter sphere. And you get a sense for this process here. You see people like Gigi Ibrahim, who was a prominent activist on the ground, live tweeting. You also see folks like Andy Carvin, who was curating from abroad. And then you also see uh, Wael Gonim, face for the movement, who wasn't tweeting a whole lot because he was incarcerated during most of the movement. But when he tweeted, he was retweeted massively. And what he tweeted about was mostly having to do with retaining the storytelling autonomy of what was going on and uh, was very critical of, of Western media. Uh, the third thing I want to talk about is this idea of solidarity that dominated the stream and was evident in tweets that appeared and um, reappeared throughout. I'll read you some examples, things like, uh, it's time to come back now and join your fellow brothers and sisters, or if the dove is a symbol of peace, the Twitter bird is a symbol of freedom, or Muslims and Christians work together in a new Egypt and Libya and Egypt one hand together revolution until victory against all dictators. These typically ended with a link to additional content, a photograph, a blog post, a live stream, or just a list of several tags for users to follow. 
And they're also evident in the semantic map that we constructed of the words that appeared most prominently on the stream. Um, so, and then the, the lines uh, between the words depict the connections between the words. Uh, the more thick the line, the more dense that connection. Um, I want to draw your attention to the central placement of the word revolution and people and contrast that to the peripheral positioning of the word protest, indicating that this movement was framed as a revolution well before it resulted in regime reversal. And some would argue, you know, still has not re resulted in full regime reconstruction. Um, there we are. The last thing I want to talk about is this idea of ambience, uh, which we define as the constancy and continuity of an always-on news environment with a pulse of its own that's organic, that's collective, it's like its own event with its own life cycle. So you may think of the event as it's going on in the ground, the event as it's being broadcast on TV, the event as it's being reported through print media, the event as it's being broadcast via Twitter. And of course, I'm alluding to the seminal Lang and Lang study of MacArthur Day in Chicago in the 50s, where they compared the experience of people participating in the parade in the streets to the experience of people watching the parade from home on their TV sets and found that people who were participating in the parade recalled an event that was chaotic, disorganized, impersonal, whereas people who were observing, who were watching the parade from home, recalled an event that was um, very organized, uh, very warm. They felt very close to the general. So it's this idea of mediality and the shape, um, the form that the mediality of a platform gives to a story as an event is turned into a story that I'm particularly interested in. But in terms of ambience, this was evident in the rhythm and the pace of the stream. So at times like these, um, you know, during the peak, for instance, there's no new news going on. It's the same news uh, being reported over and over again. This becomes even more evident as you see some of these excerpts. So it's the same news repeated over and over again, retold in a subjective manner, driven by effective reactions to what is going on, all of this sustaining an always-on presence for, for the movement, an online home for the movement that is effectively driven, which led us then to describe the form of news as effective. Um, now, I know I don't need to go over the definition uh, with this crowd, which is a new thing for me, because typically I um, talk about this work to a, um, a crowd that's more political communication oriented. But what we saw in the stream was a lot of intensity or a lot of intensities. Um, and this was present in the rhythm and the pace of the storytelling that was instant, emotive, phatic, gestural, took the form of nodding along, humming along, half-formed sentences. Um, it was also evident in the repetition, the retweeting that set the pace um, set the pace for the, for the stream, created almost you know, a rhythmicality, a musicality for the stream, uh, and fueled this intensity. Um, I think of it uh, a lot like the chorus in a Greek tragedy. And the, what the chorus does in a Greek tragedy is they take a word or a phrase and they repeat it over and over again for emphasis and to drive the main point home. And it's very similar to what was going on here. And then also was evident in this combination of oral and print cultures of storytelling. So we saw a combination of the broadcasting conventions of storytelling with the interpersonal conversation practices of storytelling. A true reconciliation of what Walter Ong might describe as a uh, primary and a secondary orality into what I've written about elsewhere as a digital and, and described elsewhere as a digital orality. So news, fact, drama, opinion, and emotion blended into one to the point where telling one from the other was not possible, and doing so kind of sort of missed the point. Um, so what does all of this mean? Uh, for us and for this study, 
what's, very, what's very important to emphasize is that affect is not an event, obviously. It is a layer to an event, and it's a way for citizens to feel, to sense their way into a story. I think what becomes problematic is when affect is reported as the event in the news, and then we get a lot of news that has intensity and not much substance. Um, affect can sustain feelings of community that can reflexively drive a movement forward or um, entrap publics in a state of engaged passivity, depending, and which of the two will happen depends on context or on conjecture. Uh, how does this connect to the idea of effective publics, and what exactly do I mean by that? Um, I understand, building on Dana Boyd's idea of network publics, I understand effective publics as network publics that are connected or disconnected through expressions of sentiment. Uh, streams mostly sustain these publics that are convened around effective commonalities. These publics materialize uniquely and leave distinct digital footprints, meaning that every movement has a different social media impact, has a different social media imprint. I know it sounds obvious, but it's worth repeating because it's often forgotten. They support connective, but not necessarily collective action, which means they support connective storytelling, but not collective storytelling. There's no central decision-making authority that decides how the story is going to be told, unless you have a very vocal curator, as was the case with um, Andy, Andy Carvin. A lot of these stories are collaboratively woven together in fragments. Uh, Again, if there is some sort of a strong curator, you may end up getting more of a cohesive, coherent story. But they do have that connective rather than um, collective aspect to them. They are powered by effective statements of opinion, fact, or a blend of both, which in turn produces ambient, always on feeds that further connect and pluralize expressions in regimes that are democratic and non, and they typically produce disruptions or interruptions of dominant political narratives by presencing, by making visible underrepresented viewpoints. Their impact is symbolic. The agency that is claimed is semantic, and the power that they afford is liminal. So a lot of times we're swayed by the virality or the spreadability of information on social media. And we expect that because there's a lot of quick movement online, that change is going to follow and it's going to be quick. And when that doesn't happen, we are disappointed. But it's not the media that have let us down. It's our own expectations that of these media that have misled us. Change is gradual. And revolutions are long, in the words of Raymond Williams, and they have to be long in order to attain meaning. And so the fact that these publics bear a, an impact of a symbolic nature is no small feat. In order to reconstruct um, our institutions, we need to reimagine them first. And I want to leave you with this last part, which I will read to make sure I get the phrasing right. And so I really understand the practices of these publics as a departure from the rationally based deliberative protocols of public spheres. I feel that they help us reimagine how we may define and understand civic discourse among network crowds in a digital era. And so while emotion has never been absent from the construction of political expression, um, romanticized idealizations of past civic eras magnify the significance of rational discourse and skim over the effective infrastructure of civic engagement. So my effort here involves synthesizing research findings to present a theoretical mo model for understanding affective publics as public formations that are textually rendered, that are discursively called into being uh, through emotive expressions that spread virally through network crowds. So in the end, technologies network us, but it is our stories that connect us identify us or divide us. Thank you.